pollen. We haven't talked about pollen yet. Pollen is extremely important. Certain beneficials cannot lay eggs unless they have fed on pollen. Surfid flies can't lay eggs unless they feed on pollen. So Patrick's trick is to put a lot of coriander out because it's just got pollen all in it. And you'll see these surfid flies just flying in and out like that. Okay. Sunflowers. Right. I once ordered Oreos and Cidiosis from the new Pirate Club for trips at the Highland Lake Inn, and they arrived. Jim was hiking, you know how he likes to hike, right? And he was hiking, he didn't get a mail, and then there was the 4th of July, and by the time, because UPS always messes up the 4th of July with their ship, they always mess up. They didn't arrive for 10 days after I was supposed to get them, and my thrift population had crashed, because that'll happen if you have it much the first time. And I'm like, I got $75 worth of Oreos and Cidiosis, and I got no food for them. I called up Jim saying, Time is all wrong. These guys are going to starve. And he's like, "Do you have any flowers, Pat?" I said, "I have flowers." I got, "Do you have any fl flowers high in pollen?" I said, "Some flowers are covered up in pollen. You know, they, they actually breed ones not to have pollen, so it won't stain the tablecloths. You know, there's so much pollen on them." And he said, "No problem." And I looked, and where was my Oreos and Cidiosis? All over the sunflowers. I think they're still there. If yeah. They're still growing flowers. They took because that's a bridge. You know, you you can't count on controlling. If you're buying insects, you can't be sure that they're going to arrive when the prey that you want them for is still around because there are natural fluctuations. So what you want to do is have these bridges of pollen, these other food sources, because they can all just switch. They're all pinch hitters. Another uh, pest that was at Highland Lake that Patrick was able to control was western flower thrips. They, those guys would put this presentation with their plates where they were using lily flowers and some other flowers. And, and also there were aphids in there, and by farmscaping and getting these beneficials in there, they were having to wash that stuff three times before farmscaping, and then afterwards they just washed it once just to make sure it was clean and put it on the plate. So uh, we're just kind of giving you examples over and over again. Here's a surfid fly in Cosmos. So Cosmos at the market. Feed my surfid flies in, in, the, in the garden, okay? Now, the other trick that you need to know, when you look at these, these insects, I'm basically going to tell you is if it's really tiny, it doesn't move very far. If it's a fly, it can go wherever it wants. And if they're bigger, they go wherever they want, all right? So depending on the type of pest you're trying to control, if you're trying to control aphids you, and you're using a little tiny parasitic wasp, they've shown genetically now that if you had a colony of aphid wasps in this field and a half a mile down the road there's another colony those two are genetically separate because it's a huge you know if you put that on a relative scale that'd be like 20 miles so it's very important what we learned out of that when I read these papers is how important it is that you have your own population locally that you're keeping healthy so that they don't have to travel real far and so that's one of the reasons if you saw earlier where we said lots of food plants spread out all over the place is way better than one big clump, unless you're dealing with surfids, because surfid flies are like helicopters. So we could put a little patch in the corner of the garden over here of umbels and maybe some of that false dandelion stuff, multiple bloom, king devil, and a few other things, and they cover the entire field. If you're using these little tiny wasps, though, you know, you're using these low dispersion. You have ground beetles and ladybugs when they're happy, and then your smaller parasitic wasp, okay? Now you have medium dispersion, which means they're going to move about a quarter of a mile, which would be from here up to the end of that field over there. And those are most parasitic wasps. Those are the ones that I showed you pictures of earlier, those coatsy ones that make the cocoons. That's about as far as they like to go. And also the paper wasps and predatory bugs. And then you get into the ones that can really fly, where the food distance is not so important, okay? Those are those hoverflies that we just saw a picture of. There's going to be a bunch of them out there. Dragonflies, tachinid flies, which are those parasitic flies, and larger parasitic wasps. In the spring, you guys probably, every spring, there's going to be flies in your window, and those are from caterpillars that have crawled into your house or beetles that have a parasitic fly in them, and then they pop out and they get in the window. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so. The ladybugs that come in are from China. 
And the reason that they come in is they normally overwinter in caves and big rock outcroppings in the mountains. So if you've got a big field like this, and here at one end of the field is this big white house, that's right where they're going to go. So there's several things you can do. You could actually change the color of your house, which actually helps white. They're very attracted to white because it looks like a rock. Um, the other thing you could do is if you're really getting a lot of them is have some organic grower come and get them and put them in their greenhouse. Man, I tell you those things, I've used them, I can't tell you how many times. When we're starting our broccoli in January, I would be vacuuming them up. Some years we'd have big populations. And actually, if you guys have been to Boone, there's Howard's Knob behind Boone, and there's a guy that lives at the top up there in a rock house named Monty Green, and I know Monty. Monty gets ladybugs about two inches thick on his rock house, so I go up there with a five-gallon bucket and a sweet broom, and I go take them and dump them in Charles Church's greenhouse or you know whoever whoever in New River Organic Growers needs needs that stuff. Okay. But you have more ladybugs. You don't want to put tons of ladybugs out in the open in one place because what do they do? They'll disperse. They'll all move out. Too crowded. Time to move on. So you don't have that many pets for them to feed on. Let's say you know you haven't got a big aphid bloom in the fall. It's getting cold. You can literally take those guys, put them in a quart jar cover them with some cheesecloth, maybe put some straw for them to hang on, on to moisten that cheesecloth, let them get a good drink, put them in the fridge or a good cold garage, and some will die during the winter, but loads will live, and you can release a few at a time as you see your pests. Indeed, even in the house, we release them in the house. You know? yeah. Clean the aphids, you know how you get aphids out your house plants and all that? I mean, basically you're saving them when you capture them. They're going to wipe out in your house if you don't do it because they haven't got any food. But if you take them and Put them into diapause, that's the word, right? Yeah. Put them into hibernation, kind of, right? Mm hmm. Then when you want them, you just go to the fridge, you have to they don't smell so great. Outside. One of, the really important, one of the really interesting things that I saw at an Entomological Society of America meeting was a guy named Joe Lewis, and Joe had taught wasps how to learn, or he had figured out that wasps learn. And what he did, he took the wasps that we're working with and he would paint caterpillars with vanilla. And the wasps would sting these caterpillars, you know, a brand new novice female would sting these caterpillars a few times and then they'd hone in on vanilla. So what he'd do during his talk, he'd have a talk like this with entomologists, he'd go over to the wall before he'd start, he'd go, watch this, I'm gonna paint vanilla on the wall and then I'm gonna open up these wasps, he'd put them way across the room and he'd paint a whole, he'd paint a spot on the wall and while he's talking, all of a sudden these wasps start showing up over there. Well, the Department of Defense got up with Joe because guess what? You can detect gunpowder that way. So they've been doing some very weird, interesting things. Uh, they got up with me on the soil wasps, on tiffy wasps, because they're tough and they bury in the ground. So if you think about this, you can use this to your own advantage. And what we would do, sometimes when I would get these wasps in the mails, I would take them and I'd open up, I'd put them in a little gelatin capsule and I'd put them right over the caterpillar and I'd have them sting them. And then what a wasp will do, a female wasp, she'll clean herself because she just, she just nuked this caterpillar. It's time to get cleaned up, get ready for the next one so that you, get, you can detect them. And what we would do then, that would make those wasps stay right in our field because what we had done is we'd brought them in, given them food and a host. Bam, they're there. There's other ways sometimes to make them stay. Um, alliums and black aphids, they just on alliums. Really hard to get things to feed on those. I bet it's the sulfur. You know, but they just don't want to feed on them. What do I do? Take ladybugs or even better yet, pre-fed lacewing larva. Put them into the sit, like chives at the Highland Lake Inn. Could get rid of the infestation, so you had to always control it, right? Can't get natural things to eat it. Put them in there cover it up with road covers. They got no choice. You, know? you may not like rutabagas or whatever, right? But if there's no other food and you can't get to the store, you'll eat rutabagas. You know? And then you train them and then later on, you start seeing some, some ones that come in there and feed on it because they've learned to eat it. They developed a taste for it because they had no choice. But it does take time to do some of these things. All right, I haven't been going, I mean, I haven't been saying the numbers, but we're on the back on number six. And so one thing that I'll tell you guys, and most of you in here know this, we have extremes now. We have extremes of heat and we have extremes of drought. 
And so you better have, just like here, I come try to use my laptop, it doesn't work on the projector, so we hooked that one up. We have a few little problems, but we have plan A, plan B, and plan C. That's actually plan A. This was plan B. And you've got to have the same thing. You guys know this as well, and, I, and I'll tell you right now, is I've holstered up many a time and I've sprayed, because I had to. And so sometimes these systems fail. What Pat would say is hold your fire, and sometimes you can hold your fire, but the way you can hold your fire is if you know what your economic threshold is. You've got to know your who, what, when, where, why, and how for your bug. If you don't know that, that's just like somebody coming, in, coming to you guys and going, we're going to start a war, but we're not sure who it's with, and we're not sure how long it's going to go on. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and all of a sudden you're kind of like, well, wait a minute. Uh, that's not, you can't fight wars, you know, that's not the way, I grew up in a, I'm a military brat too. So there's a, there's a way we would go about this and an, another way where somebody comes in, sells you a bill of goods, they've got you. So that's why I say who, when, what, where, why, and how. We, if you don't know that, you need to learn it or if somebody comes to you with some kind of proposition and you can't tease that out of them, I'd be walking real careful, you know, or be, be very, uh, very, uh, just be very careful. And I say, I say hold your fire, but this spring with the Kudzu bug, I said fire all the time. You know, yeah, time, time well, exactly. For something like that, if you can control it that way. I control it. I right. know bugs are real tough. This is a new bad one. It's, it's an invasive. There isn't a lot of things, there aren't a lot of things that eat it. Clean it up when it's in a place where I don't mind using poison. Right. You know, and it's, I'm saying it's pre-benign poison, but it's still poisonous. I'm sure there's some beneficials that don't let you know. Right. You always get told, oh, it doesn't hurt beneficials. It's like things aren't. Oh, it's a balance. Bad. It's a balance. Yeah. It's just like here with this okra. What happened with this okra, you guys, is it got Argentine ants on it. I don't have a real good. There's an Argentine ant right there. So what happened? Those ants would keep all the beneficials away. Boy, if they could find a surfed larva, they'd chew on it and worry it, and they're crawling all over ladybugs, and ladybugs are sitting like this. So what we had to do, knock the ants off and put a little tangle foot. I use a lot of tang, you know, I use tangle foot sometimes. I'm not shy about using it on some plants that I don't want ants on. So ants can be both good and bad, because ants like to herd aphids. In the Orient, they actually put sticks between trees. That's to get right. The ants to move from one tree to another. That's tree. right. Always the case. Drips feed on spider mites. You know? Right. Like, sometimes pests are also predators. You know, there isn't black and white. It's, you have to see each situation and see what the dynamic you're looking at is. Here is a, this is a shot of my foot in Jewel Morrow's field where we had a gallon of ladybugs per three acres. And I'll tell you what I did. I walked that whole field. It took me about a couple hours, but I just shake two or three ladybugs out about every fourth plant. I came back a week later, they were all in there because they weren't crowded anymore and it was wet. You can see it had rained, it's kind of dewy, Woo. almost did. But, um, and so that also, the other thing that I'll tell you guys when you release ladybugs, if you can put them out close to dark right before a rain and if you can spray 10% sugar water, you'll keep them around because that sugar water tells them that there's aphids there. They, they drink that and they're like, there's aphids here. Bam, they will stay, okay? 